S-I-E mead. I don't know, I always wanna throw gang signs whenever I say that word, but, so I just had to do it. Anyway, so somebody suggested that we make an S-I-E mead, and I thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. Let's uh, go with that. And we had a vague recollection that recently we saw an S-I-E berry juice, and then when we went to go purchase it, not a clue. No. So we found this thing at Publix, I think, right? It was Publix. Yes, yeah, it was Publix. Yep. For smoothies. And I was like, well, actually, Derica saw it, and I looked at it, and I'm like, okay, well, let's see. The only thing that actually contains is acai puree and less than 0.5% citric acid. So that should work out okay. Citric acid, in this case, might actually help, because I was thinking of adding a little bit of like a citric or a lemon type of aspect to it, but I thought, let's hold off on that. But a little bit of citric acid might actually add that slight bit of element that we want. But here's the thing. There's eight packets of this stuff. They were frozen, so it's like just this liquid inside. But this way, you can actually get this, um, and you can recreate this meat. Sounds really weird to use this this way, but you know, we're gonna do it. And, okay, here's the thing. There's like no sugars in each of these packets, according to this. Berries have very little sugar. So I'm not gonna count them as a sugar in this particular meat. I know that sounds weird, but we're just gonna use the honey as our sugars. So there's the package. I don't know if this is something that you can get on Amazon. I don't think so. I can look. If I do find it, I will make sure to link it in the description below. So we had these uh, defrosted now. They've been sitting in the fridge. Um, they're very cold, but here's the thing. Every one of these packages has to be dumped out into here, and then we have to rinse it out to get all the juices out. So it's gonna be a multi-stage process, and I'm gonna do one on camera and probably make a mess and then we'll show you the rest. Because I think you're actually supposed to use them frozen, like right into the into your blender. But because we defrosted them, it makes it messy. But hey, we have acai berry juice. You know, I didn't know how else to get it. So if you're not familiar with acai berries, they're this new hot thing. Everybody's yeah, from like five years ago. Bowls and smoothies and all that stuff. But basically, they're the berries of a palm tree. The the same palm tree that is harvested to create hearts of palm. That's just the core of baby palm trees. Oh, but really? Th these are the berries of that mature palm. Yeah, so, I didn't know that. So there you go. We learn something, something new every day. Every day. <laughs> I need skizzers. Okay, we happen to have some. <sighs> Sorry, Drew, I'm using your left-handed scissors with my right hand. <laughs> these are the wrong scissors. I'm gonna have to get a different pair of scissors. Okay. Okay, you're gonna have to rinse that out in there. So how, how do you... Gotta get all the juice out into the water. Okay. And I gotta go put these in the sink, I'll go back. That's right, I said skizzers. You know why? Because I like to call things weird names, like tortillas, I call them tortillas. I just do, it's just weird. Um, so, something has occurred to me about this. We are going to be making a mess with this, and I think having the tear at the side over there is really no good for me, so I'm just gonna cut the tops off. But, some things that we wanna talk about. First, we had three pounds of Wildflower. Uh, wildflower honey in here, and we have 96 ounces of water. I started with exactly 96 ounces, because 96 ounces of water and three pounds of honey makes for a one gallon batch. Now, each of these does contain a little bit. It's like 3.5 ounces, so we have 28 ounces of more liquid going in. But we're using a 1.4 gallon fermenter, so after everything settles out to the bottom and we rack it off, we should end up with about one gallon when we're done. So that's kind of my plan my story and I'm sticking to it. So I'm just gonna snip the top like that. Take it all the way off. All the way off. All the way off? Okay, well, I didn't off. want it to fall in. That's why I was holding it for you. And then I can go like that and I can fold it over and give it a good, like the toothpaste squeeze as long as I don't like squirt it out. Cause it's, it's like a, it's a puree, but there's definitely some salads in there too. Okay, this is gonna take a couple minutes. <sighs> okay. That was relatively unpleasant. So yeah, our first observation would be if you were able to find acai juice, that may Use be that. the preferred method because that was just kind of I unpleasant. I mean, this, this does the job, but it wasn't fun. Let's put it that way. And they're so small. And if you tried making anything more than a one gallon batch, I think it would be a little bit tedious and I'd probably give up and throw something before I was done. <laughs> um, so what we want to do now is add our water. And we already know 96 ounces of water, so just pour it right in. So I just used the water that we already had to rinse out the packets to get all the flavor, as Brian said. To get all the flavor. So that's why our flavor. water is colored. 
Yeah, this used to be clean. It, it's, it's clean water. It just has some SIE remnants in it. You want all of it? Or? All of it. Every bit of it. Everything goes in. I'm going to start mixing this up because that honey is not dissolved in there at all. It takes a long time to mix it this way. If you have the drill extension or something, go for it. Um, I just never think to do that before we sit down to do this. And I don't, I don't know if we even have one anymore, do we? Uh, we don't yeah. have the mixer attached. We, we have the degassing wick. We, yeah, but I think it would... Well, it's not a paddle. It's just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, the mixing one is like two little wings that stick out. Here, if you want to mix for a while, I will uh, start talking about the other stuff that goes in. All right. Okay, so some of the things that we like to put into the meads are semi-optional, um, but some of them are, are going to be very, very helpful. And they all add a complexity or add a level of... Uh, sophistication to the mead and make it taste better in the long run. So it's kind of important. The first thing that we like to add is yeast nutrient. And today we are using Fermaid O. Uh, we always use Fermaid O because, you know, it's the organic version, meaning it's somewhat healthier than some of the others. It's basically just a nitrogen source for the yeast. It also contains some dead yeast cells in it. So it's a really good thing. This is 2.5 grams mixed in with a little bit of water. Dump it in. I like to let it go for a couple minutes beforehand, mix it up, because that way it dissolves fully, works really, really well. The next thing that I'm going to add is pectic enzyme. Now, if you're not familiar, pectic enzyme is going to be an optional ingredient, but it will help it to clear out. There's a lot of pectin in these fruits, so uh, I'm assuming because it's just a puree of the fruit, it's not a juice. There's still a lot of skin, seeds, that sort of thing in there, like ground up. So I'm going to be using half a teaspoon of pectic enzyme. It'll help it to clear as time goes on. And then the last, and this is definitely optional, but it's going to improve the flavor, is wine tannin. And that, this is for mouthfeel. We tend to like a, a more tannic experience. I know that because this is just ground fruit, it's gonna have some tannins in there. So you can use half, a quarter to a half teaspoon is the recommendation. I'm gonna use like a quarter teaspoon. I'm using a half teaspoon measure, but I'm only filling it about halfway. Now, this is something that can also be adjusted after the fact, once fermentation is done. But I'm putting in a quarter teaspoon now just because I have a feeling we're going to like it that way at least. If you don't want to use wine tannin, you can go ahead and use black tea. You want to use just a straight black tea rather than a flavored black tea because if you Unless use something you flavor flavored, it. then you're going to add that flavor. Where we're right. looking to use the tea simply as a tannin uh, additive. Right. At this point, if she's got it mixed up, I think it's pretty good. Let's let's check. Since this is so dark, it's kind of difficult to see. So what I want to do is just kind of scrape across the bottom, see if I can scoop up any solid honey. And yep, there is some. Oh. I got a little bit across the middle. It happens. When you're mixing it in the initial phase, you can be sloppy. Uh, just try not to splash your partner or yourself. Um, you don't want it to leave the vessel when you're shaking it up and mixing it, but um, it's totally okay to get some air in there, slosh it around. You want to get some aeration. So see, like doing that, getting it going real good. And then you break the current. That adds oxygen into the must. The yeast really need that to get the colony started. Otherwise you can get some off smells and off flavors like that sulfur smell. A lot of that comes from not enough aeration. You just want to make sure that after the yeasts are activated and they've started to produce alcohol that you do not oxygenate at that point yeah. because you could possibly be end up making vinegar rather than a yeah. fermented beverage. Okay, so now I'm going to take a reading, just set that to the side. And for that, we use the handy dandy hydrometer, also known as the hydropter, because if I was to just let this fall in here, it might explode in there. Um, they do make plastic ones, the Herculometer. We'll, we can have links to both of those. I like the glass ones. They're easier to read. I just feel better about it with being glass. I don't know. Yes, I know I'm holding a plastic baster. I, I, I see the irony in that, trust me. But this was the master baster. It did win the competition that we had on all the different basters and sampling methods. It did actually work out the best. Now, here's one thing about using all that puree. We may get a false reading because it's gonna be a little thicker than normal. And I think we are. This reading should be no more than 1.105. Oh, okay, not bad. I, I figured it would be a little bit below 1.105 because we did add 24, well, 28 more ounces of that stuff to it. I was wondering if it was gonna thicken it too much to get a good reading, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like um, 1.096. 
So yeah, that's right in the ballpark of where it should be. That's gonna give us somewhere in like the 13 or so percent range if this was to go dry, which is the expectation. That way we can make alterations and sweetness levels and things like that at our whim later on. That's right, I said whim. I don't use that word very often, but uh, gives you some control. We used to actually like to try to have fermentation stop before it got to the tolerance of the yeast so that there was still residual sugars and that kind of thing. We found that that's a little more fickle to try to actually get to work right, and it's a lot more guesswork. So this way it's just very repeatable, very consistent. It's easy for us to show you this and say, okay, do this, do this, let it go to 1.000 or fully dry, pasteurize it, and then you can add sweetness to your heart's content and get it as sweet as you like or as dry as you like, and then, you know, it's yours. Personalize it the way you want. And today we're going to be using Red Star Premier Classic yeast, and uh, why are we using this yeast? Oh, thank you for asking, Brian. We're using Red Star Premier Classique because it is a strong fermenter and a good alcohol tolerance that is useful in producing dry, full-bodied red and white wines. This well, is kind of a grayish red brown, <laughs> sort of, so it's, it's red adjacent. Yeah, it's close enough. <laughs> we'll leave a wine with intense color and excellent flavor complexity. Google Foo is your friend. <laughs> while preserving tannin content. So this may help preserve the not only the tannins that we added, but the tannins that perhaps are actually in there from the blitz, the berries themselves. Uh, the yeast, yeast will produce hydrogen sulfide gas in the presence of excess sulfur compounds and therefore should not be used in fermenting grapes that contain residual sulfur dust. We don't have those problems, yeah. so we're not concerned. Its ideal temperature range for fermentation is 59 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit which we're right in the middle of We're gonna that. be at like 75 or so Fahrenheit. So, so we're, that's perfect. And its alcohol tolerance is roughly 13%, but as always, yeast can't read. Right, now remember I said this could go to about 13.5. I'm gonna say that half percent variance is totally fine. So this may not go completely, completely dry, or it might. Either way, it's totally fine. We just wanna make sure that it's done. Also, it's a Red Star yeast packet. I love their yeast. I just really wish they would make terrible packets so I don't have to do that. I know, it's a minor thing, and it's annoying, and it's probably annoying for you to watch me do that all the time or <laughs> complain about it, but it bothers me, because others, I can just tear them open. Somebody said just put a notch in the side, and I said, well, where's the fun in that? Because then I don't get to complain about it every time. But that is not a bad idea. And I'm using the whole packet because we found, just seems to work a little bit better, gets it started faster, and whack your packet. Very important, get all the little yeasty beasties out of there. Make sure you get every single one, every yeast is sacred. Okay, so we have our first reading, we have all of our stuff in there. All we need now is a, a lid and an airlock. All right. Okay, so we have the lid on, airlock in, and I love these airlocks because the plastic fit on these works really, really well. And S-type three-piece airlock really doesn't matter. Uh, a couple of people have asked about that recently. I just like the S-type better. It's an aesthetic thing. They're harder to clean than the three-piece, three but I like seeing it go bloop, bloop, whereas the three-piece, I don't know. I just don't like the way it bubbles. Now, we have filled our airlock with diluted sanitization liquid because it's handy. It's right over there in turbos. Mm -hmm. So all of our stuff has been sanitized in the red bucket of sanitization, so it just made it easier for us to fill it with that. Now, if you have another preferred liquid to fill your airlock, then go ahead. Just make sure that whatever you put in there is gonna kill the bugs, that litter of bugs that are gonna try to get to your, your yummy goodness, and won't be something that'll be harmful to you. Yeah, like don't use rubbing alcohol. In case for some reason some of that liquid ends up in. What we here. do is the first, initially we always have turbos going with the tub there. So we just fill it with sanitizer fluid, no big deal. But if this was to overflow and I had to refill it or clean this out, I usually use like a crappy whiskey or scotch like Scoresby and put that some of that in there. That way it can, what? That way, it's still a, something that's going to kill off any bugs, but it still uh, you know, works as the uh, one-way valve, because that's what this really is. It just lets the, the gases escape up, down, and back out without anything being able to come back in. You might see some fruit flies in the bottom, especially if you live in Florida like we do. That and just simply means it did its job. Yeah, because they're not gonna get back out. They, they die in this stuff pretty easily. So what are we gonna do now? Speaking of gases, fermentation is a process that produces a lot of gas. And mm. that's why an airlock is really important. Because if you just put a lid on this and let it ferment, 
you're it's going, going to, to explode. explode your vessel, and yeah. that's bad. And make a big mess. Yeah. And possibly be dangerous. These are glass. Yeah. Um, also, some other things. During fermentation, you will see foam form on the top of this. You might even see brownish foam form, like a crust almost, around the sides of this. That's called a croissant line. Totally normal, totally safe. You also may see sediment filling the bottom. Again, totally normal, totally safe. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. What we're looking for is we want to see this airlock startup activity and then wait a few weeks. And when we see it almost at no activity or no activity, then it's time to take the first reading. Doesn't mean it's done. First reading, and we'll be back to show you that in about four seconds. Started this 12 days ago. It's time to take its first reading. It is still very slowly bubbling, but you know, hey, it's it's time. Let's just take its first check and see where it's at. It might not be done yet. It's goopy. Oh, wow, is it goopy? It's all sorts of goopy. It's not pleasant looking in there. Looks like a couple of tar pit oil spills kind of thing <laughs> happened in there. But there's no mold. There's no things growing. So I'm going to say there's nothing untoward going on. But this is an example of things can look really, really weird and still be totally fine. I mean, that just looks kind of crazy to me. But I think what it is, is there might have been some oils in the fruit. And then we have the fruit all around it. And if you look really close, you can see little bubbles popping. That's the fermentation happening. This is what it probably should look like, I think. For real, when you get close, it smells like fruit. So That's a good sign. Whoops. So I don't think we have a problem, but I do believe that that's a little bit of oil floating on top, which could be a problem yeah. if left too long. We're going to be careful with that. So I'm going to try to go around that so I don't mix it in. And let's get its first reading and see where we're at. See, when you get underneath that, look at that. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. The yeast, we're very happy with this particular <laughs> concoction. This started at 1.096, and in 11 days, it is 1.002. So it may not be done yet. So I'm gonna do, we're gonna pour that sample back in. Everything's been sanitized. Um, I wanna avoid the, um, the lava pits here, but um, yeah, those are oil. I can see it now. They're not really moving as I, Pour this in. Now, we do have a couple of options. I can try scooping off the top of that, which probably isn't a bad idea just to keep it from potentially going rancid. Um, yeah, let's do that. So we have this little, well, let me show you. We have this guy. It's like a little tiny sieve. Yeah, it, I don't know if it's for tea or what is it? What's I think it it's intended for tea. I use it for scooping out stuff that's in things that we don't want in them. Like this. Like this. And what I'm literally going to do, I don't know that I can really scoop out oil. Oh, it's kind of coming off. It is a film, so definitely some sort of an oil-like product. Um, and it's it's coming out, more or less. Some of it's reforming, but it's definitely oil, because now it's forming droplets. So that's something you want to get removed. Um, I'm going to take some of the scum off the top, too, which is really just fruit leavens for lack of a better word. That's a Derricka word. Yes, it is. I never said that word before I met Derricka. It's all her fault. Now, if you're really worried about this and doing this and oxidizing or whatever, then don't do it. Um, I don't really think much harm would come by not doing it. I know someone will ask why we didn't do it, how you would do it if you wanted to. So we're showing how you do it. I'm really not getting the oil out of here, but I am getting some of the scum off. And it looks like the croissant really went to town on the sides. That's possible problem for mold, but I don't think so. Um, the fact that this fermented so quickly, there's a lot of gas being formed. There's a lot of alcohol in here right now. Not really all that worried about More than likely, danger of it. We're going to be racking this next week. So. Yeah, this is going to get racked pretty soon, which is surprising. Most things take, you know, three, four weeks. This is going to get racked after like two weeks. Um, but yeah, I'm not really catching the oil. If I wanted to use a spoon and get in there, I could probably do it. But I did get some of the scum off of it. I feel marginally better about this. No, I, I'm really not worried about it at all. Because when we pulled that sample from underneath, it was fine. And it smells like fruit. It really does. It smells like fruit. All right. So we're, we're going to put the lid. lid back on. I took my note. Remove scum. I literally wrote that on there. Then we're going to put this back on here, put it back in the fermentation station, give it another week. We'll check that. If it's done, we'll be able to rack it off of those oils and the scum right away. 
move on to the next step, no problem. Okay, so it's been another seven days. It means it's time to take a look again. And, well, still looks kind of like a swamp. Um, it, there's, there's bubbles in there. There's some black pools of stuff. I'm assuming there was oils in this. And we're gonna rack this today because it was at 1.002 last time we checked. I don't like having those oils in there. Oils can go rancid. Oils can give, give really, really weird off flavors. So I don't wanna keep them in there any longer than we have to. I think it's, it's been going for two weeks, three weeks. Um, yeah, like three weeks. I think it's time if, if it's done. I mean, obviously it was 1.002, you know. Cause the thing is it smells quite nice, but it does have some weird off colors. And as Derek has said off camera, it's like a palm tree berry. So, you know, what do you expect? It's gonna be weird. <laughs> but the color of it is gorgeous. I mean, that is absolutely beautiful. And then it does some weird funky stuff and it's gotta be oils. See how it's sticking to the baster? Yeah. It's oils. So we'll be racking off those oils today. However, it's sitting, oh, it did drop a, a two more points. Not enough to worry about in this case cause it's gonna just get racked and sit for a little while. 1.000, so we went down two more points. So 1.000. So what we're gonna do now is rack this to a different container. We're just gonna put it into a, the narrow mouth regular, regular fermenter. I'm going to try to leave the scum that's floating on top in here and all the stuff at the bottom. There's a lot of lees, so we're probably gonna get quite a bit of loss on this particular brew. So when we rack it, we're going to try to keep our suction zone yeah. in the middle here so that we don't go down into this section that's all the solids and we don't suck any of the oils that are exploding on the very top. Well, I think they deserve to have a look at this. All right. So first, looking at the side here, yes, that really is the lees on the side of the container. Yep, there, because pointing out a finger to show you exactly where it is. It's kind of crazy. When we go up inside, now you see the pools of oil that I'm talking about. And the, um, I mean, nothing, I can say nothing better than green goop. But I think that's the uh, skins and pits and whatnot of the berries themselves that have just been pureed. But those pools that you see, those are oily because it's stuck to the baser in a weird way. So when you see things like this, it's best to try to rack it off as quickly as possible. Now, before anyone freaks out, there's no inherent danger here at this point, okay? The worst that can happen is those oils can go rancid, just like if you're using whole nuts and things like that, or you put like olive oil into a brew, it can go rancid. I don't think it has because there's no off smell. You would not know any of that was there if we didn't show you. So we wanted you to see this so that you know it's probably still okay if you see something like this. The trick is use your senses, smell it. Give it a taste. I actually would like to taste this to see what does this taste like? Because if it tastes absolutely disgusting, there's no point in moving forward. Even as I pull the hydrometer out of here, I can see oil on the side of the container. That's a little disconcerting to me. It doesn't mean it's spoiled, but it means it has a potential to be weird. Yeah, there's oils floating on top. We are gonna try to scoop it up or to get it out of there, but it smells wonderful though. Smells fruity. It tastes like a dry mead. Mm -hmm. Doesn't taste like, and that's the trick. Use your senses, look at it. Okay, it looks a little funky. Time to investigate further. It doesn't smell bad at all. It smells fruity and fresh. Taste, it's dry and it's young, but it doesn't taste like something rotting. It doesn't taste like something that you shouldn't be consuming. That's why we have these flavor senses and, and tastes to know when food is good or bad. In this case, it's not. I think if it sat too long like this, it could become that, but it could take months. What do you think? Very interesting. It's different. Um, I, don't, I don't think I hate it. I don't love it yet. Um, I, I think it needs some sweetening. I think it also needs some backbone. Needs a little something. Needs a little something, something. But first, let's rack this. And I'm not going to dump this right back in. I'm gonna put this into the pitcher or the container separately, and we're gonna rack this entire batch. Okay, so what I wanna do is just pour this into the new fermenter carefully. 
there's some oils, but the oil seems to be floating on the surface. So maybe this will get racked today and we'll rack it again in a week or two to get rid of some more of those oils. Here, have that back. But otherwise, a racking procedure is much the same, really. I'm keeping the cap on it. I just don't want to bury it into the lees at the bottom. We still have the end goes into the rack, racky. And this part goes into the racker or the source. source. I'm only going to go about halfway down and just do enough pumps to get it going. It's going. You're going. And now I have to be very, very careful where I place this. All right. So he's going to pay attention now. I have it about here, about halfway through. And as it gets lower, I'm just going to keep an eye on it. All I really want to avoid all the stuff at the top and all the stuff at the bottom. Now I can tell that these are oils for sure, because as it's sitting here now, I tipped it up. They're turning into perfect circles on the surface. They look like amoebas and then they form circles. So yeah, it's definitely oils, which is a bad sign, but it means that there was some oils in there. Okay. This could potentially have the outcome of spoilage in the long term, if left this way. By removing the oils and getting them out of there, that helps a lot. And we're going to keep a little more vigilant on this one. We're going to rack it probably more than once more just to make sure that we get them all out before it gets put away for preservation, because that will spoil over time. Um, a lot of people do use whole nuts, peanut butters, and all kinds of stuff in their brews. So putting oil into a brew isn't a guarantee of spoilage. It's just you want to keep a good eye on it. This has the strangest looking lease I've ever seen. It's, it looks like green slime, although it's not green. It's red. I know, I'm making this sound so good, right? <laughs> so we are nearing the curve. Yeah, we're above the curve now on this, so if you want to pull it. I'm done. It was starting to get to the where it was sucking up goop. I don't want goop. But yeah, it's it's very thick lees. We did fill the, the uh, one gallon fermenter enough that I'm not worried about headspace. Um, but we looks like avoided most of the stuff that we didn't want in there. Yeah, let me get a bung and airlock. Yes. So there's a new skill we learned today, right? Um, when you see oils and things like that, it's not necessarily bad because it's not like mold. Okay, mold is pervasive and gets through the whole thing. Yeah. There was no mold. There was nothing growing. Yeah, oil by nature is going to float to the top and yep. separate itself. And so if you notice, we left a lot behind, but that way we minimized drastically the amount of oil that got transferred to our new vessel. Oh yeah, I mean, I can see like, you know, that weird like rainbow pattern almost on the top but it's very, very minimal. And there's always a little bit of oils in almost every brew because there are oils in anything, you know what I mean? But in this one, that was a little more than I'm comfortable with leaving for any length of time. So it sat in there for two weeks, that's enough, moving on. But here's the key, because we tasted it, because we smelled it, because we looked at it, we know it didn't actually have a chance to hurt this brew at all. So we saved it, yay. yay. So there's another thing I want to point out now as far as your cleaning regimen. If you notice, the auto siphon and everything is left in here. I have not put it into turbos, and that's because it is severely gunky right now. I don't want to put it into turbos because that's going to completely contaminate all of my sanitizer li liquid. And we still have more to do today. So I'm going to take this to the sink instead yeah. and wash it out thoroughly before I return it to turbo so that it can be sanitized. Exactly. And uh, this is going to sit for probably a week, maybe two. We'll be back to show you what it looks like at that point. Okay, this has been sitting for about two weeks. We know it's done because it was at 1.000 before. So we racked it and there's still some sediment in the bottom. So we're going to rack it again. Now, because this is a goop of insanity, I'm not surprised that we need to double rack. We need to double rack in normal situations. This guy. It actually smells pretty good. Really? Yeah. Well, that's good. Okay, both of us are a little trepidatious about this one. That's the best word. Because if you look at it, it kind of looks like swamp water. It's, it's not swamp water. It's like a tar pit. Yeah. There it, should be dinosaurs in there. We were expecting different. And this is coming out a little bit weird. So <laughs> it may taste amazing. It doesn't smell bad. We don't know. It smells pretty fruity. I, we'll find out. But anyway, we're going to rack it to a pitcher and do our pre penultimate tasting. That's what it is, penultimate tasting. So we're going to rack it right now. You've seen us do this, so we're just going to rack it. It's racked. And I got some of this stuff up in it. So it's going to have to just sit. 
for a little while before we bottle it. But. More than likely, there's going to be additions, and then for more likely, there'll be pasteurization, which will then for more than likely need more racking. So it's all good. It's a lot of more than likelies. I did that for effect. It was effective. <laughs> See, smell that. It smells, it, it smells kind of like a plum date mixture. Oh yeah. Like it's not, it's not bad. It seems like this should be weird, but it's actually not. It's, and even look at the color. It's looking more like a grape color, like a, a deep burgundy. I'm still gonna let you taste it first. Okay. Well, this is dry, so this is 1.000. Did it make an unpleasant face? It's dry. I think it needs to be sweetened. But that's kind of typical now. But it's not horrible. Mm -hmm. It's got a fruitiness, like a berry fruity kind of plum. I wasn't far off when I said date syrup. When I said date, the date syrup. It's got like an, a fruity, earthy combo. Yeah. It's like an earthy berry. With like a astringent, sharp... Almost acidic aftertaste. A little bit. Did you get that? Yeah, a little bit. It is delayed too, so it's like, whoa, where'd you where'd you come from? But anyway, we're gonna add some honey. Honey. All right, we happen to have some wildflower honey that isn't crystallized, or was. I think we uncrystallized this. Yeah, and I think this needs a significant amount of sweetness. So I'm gonna try to estimate half a pound to start with. Yeah, because our intent was to make this a mead, and I'm not getting any honey notes. No, there's really no honey character at all. That acai is some strong stuff, so let's boost it up. I'm going to have to do an ABV check in just a <clears> second. <throat> okay, remember when I said this wasn't crystallized? I was wrong. A good portion of this is crystallized. <laughs> we got a spoon. Yeah. Want to just get in there? Yeah, I guess I can do that. People ask all the time, can you use crystallized honey? Of course you can. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just hardened. It just hardened. has its own complications. Yeah. And it's messy. Like I already got it on my hand and I'm going to be sticky. <sighs> All right. I think that's a good half pound. <sighs> Can you mix that while I wash my hands? Yes. When you're mixing after the fact like this in an open pitcher, be careful. Try not to disturb it too, too much. There's always an inherent risk of oxygenation. Now, we talk about that a lot, but please don't let that prevent you from doing this. It certainly doesn't stop us. I mean, we still mix it. We're just careful. We've yet to have anything really go off from oxygenation or anything like that. So right. it's more just a... Keep in mind and be careful, be mindful of it. But There are actually some times where oxygenation is required in the process. For example, sherry is... However, we very rarely try to make sherry. Right, but I, I, just, wanted, never I just wanted to uh, <laughs> say that... There are processes that it is encouraged. Right, because yes. uh, I think some people take what we say and just run with it. Right. Oxygenation isn't necessarily bad. It's right. usually an unwanted effect. Right. It's something you try to avoid, but that doesn't necessarily mean, oh my gosh, I saw some sloshing, so I'm just going to dump my whole brew. Please yeah, don't, don't do, do that. Yeah, don't do that. We've had people do that. Or they think that because their airlock was off that they have to dump it. No, 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 no. Many, many people do open fermentation, and there's nothing wrong with that. We don't because we have cats, and I don't really want to go... Every time I have a glass of wine. That was a lovely illustration. Thank you. <laughs> they know what I mean. The only downside to crystallized honey is it does take a lot more effort to mix it. Yeah, and because this brew is so incredibly dark, beautifully I so, can't see. might I say, you can't see a darn thing. So you have to kind of do it by the braille method. Now, when I started stirring it, it was certainly more viscous. It's crunchy. At the bottom than it was at the top, so... Hopefully now Brian can determine. Oh, I don't think there's much liquid left. I think there's just some crystals floating around in there. Okay. But there's not, no, there's very little on the spoon. See, just the bottom, just a tiny little oh, bit yeah. of crystals on the spoon. All right, I'm just gonna leave that in there and pour us off a quick little sample. Well, this sample is to tell us, did we sweeten it enough? Yeah. 
was sweetening the answer. We don't know. We say this in all of our we'll videos where out. we back sweeten now. Um, we don't measure the amount that we're putting in. We're going to give you a final reading, a gravity reading that tells you that's the number. That's how much we sweeten it. That way, no matter where yours finished and no matter what volume you have, you can match the sweetness level that we did. If you want to, because your sweetness preference may vastly differ from our sweetness preference. We're just trying to give you a guideline. Right? I wasn't even looking at him, so I didn't get any of the notes. What, what was he doing? Tell me, people. Mm. Yeah, it's actually quite nice. Hmm. I'm debating whether it needs more. I, th I think it needs just a little bit more honey. I'd like more honey character is what it is. The sweetness level is actually all right. Yeah, up front it's great, but at the very end that has yeah. a weird little... Yeah, it does. So let's get some more honey and put it in there. I'm not using that. No. No? I'm going to get liquid honey and put it in. Okay. It's easier. My hands don't get all sticky. Now I'm going to add some sourwood honey. Now, I'm not going to add enough that's really going to make much difference what kind of honey I use. There are differences. And had we sweetened this with a citrus honey, it would taste a little bit different. Sourwood honey is actually our favorite for, for doing this. It's a very neutral honey, but it has a great flavor. I personally feel that a citrus honey would work well with this particular... I don't. I didn't say it wouldn't. Oh, I sure. just would offer a slightly different flavor. I'm just saying that if, if you have limited options, yeah. I think wildflower would be great. I think clover would be great. I think... Sourwood would be great. We haven't I, had a clover in I a long think, time. Uh, orange blossom would be great. By the way, orange blossom is also known as Florida wildflower. <laughs> we, were, we were noticing earlier we had some some orange blossom and some wildflower. They were both crystallized, just a little bit left. I was like, ah, oh, mix them together. And she's like, yeah, it's Florida wildflower. Florida wildflower. <laughs> uh, some beekeepers might be angry with us. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it kind of is. I mean, you know, we don't generally mix honeys unless it's just for use around the house, you know, if you're cooking with them, that sort of thing. Generally, when we're brewing, we try to keep them as pure as possible. Yeah, normally our excess honey gets moved over there to our tea station, so mm -hmm. that way we can use it to sweeten our tea. The color of this is gorgeous. Yep. It actually looks more like a grape wine than it does, it does. anything else. Or, this is surprising. Or elderberry, because it's so yeah. super dark. But it doesn't have quite the earthiness of elderberry. No, it doesn't. Which it's I'm definitely more grateful. more of a berry flavor, like a blueberry or a, a blueberry raspberry combo kind of. The smell is still earthy, like mm -hmm. almost date plum, like the date. The, remember the date syrup wine? Yeah, and that makes sense to me. The dates, because if you think about it, where do dates come from? The date palm. Yeah. So oh. acai is a berry of a palm. Oh, maybe they're well, maybe they're distantly related for all I know. Yeah, it's it's definitely now there's more honey character. Everything on nose. Yeah, it's a little earthy, a little honey, a little berry. Mm. But I think on the taste now, it's really nice. So I'm just gonna make sure this is mixed thoroughly. I, I don't know how well I mixed it that last time. It still has the Really? When you exhale, if you do the exaggerated Derica exhale, you'll get it more. <laughs> so who does that? I don't know. Me, barely. Oh, I see what you mean. It's almost like a an acidic bite yeah. right at the end. Yeah, like almost coffee. I don't know that I don't know that it'd go quite that far. It's an earthy, yeah, I guess I see where you're getting coffee from. Coffee adjacent. This is an interesting flavor, not what I expected, and better than I thought it was going to be. So right, right. When we we were, did not have high hopes coming into this episode today. We were discussing this pre-filming, and we're like, yeah, I don't know about this one. So what's going to happen with this now is we are going to rack it to a to a regular fermenter, probably a uh, wrong, 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 any wrong. We're going to take it to gravity reading. Okay, I'm still right as what's going to happen to it after that. But, yeah. Well, here we don't need this. Anymore. One thing at a time. Oh, I have to give my, my estimate. Oh, math, numbers. Okay, I'm guessing we added a pretty good amount this time. I'm going to say 1.020. Okay. That, that is, that's where I think it is. I could probably just pour this into the thing. But. And any of you 
who are itching to jump into the comments and say, we want Terrica's estimate. Don't do that to me. I don't do numbers, people. Z14Q. Purple. Book zebra. Flying antelope. Chartreuse. The funny thing is, if you speak Derica, you might actually be able to decipher that. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't know what's going on with me lately. The other day I was 10 points too high. Now I'm 10 points too low. This is actually a little higher than I thought it was going to be. We oversweetened it. I'm not surprised due to the... It's 1.030, which is still not crazy stupid high. Five... Four, 23, honey. See, Bri is projecting into Two, the future. Three. He just wrote five, five. <laughs> Whoops. Because Cinco de Mayo. Woohoo! May the fourth be with you. Anyway. So yeah, 1.030. It's a little sweeter than I thought, but I think it's, maybe it's the earthiness of the berry. I, I think it's the earthiness and then that funk at the very end yeah. that needs to be pushed Made you need a little bit more. Yeah. But see, that's the beautiful thing about the system that we do is we're not doing it to hit a, an exact number. We're not doing it to get a certain poundage of honey. No, we're doing, we're it, doing it, it until we like it. Let me address this. We've had a couple of people make statements like, well, that's way too sweet. You're basically just eating sugar. Okay. I can sort of see what they're saying and I, I don't disagree with them completely, but let me put it to you a different way. If we sweeten this, and stopped short of where we liked it, it's going to sit on the shelf and probably not get touched. But by putting 10 more points of sweetness into it, now we both like it, and it's something we might actually reach for. Does that make it wrong? I don't think so. I think that's the right thing to do. <laughs> make it how you like it. And, because, and everybody's different. Because our intent is to educate you and teach you and help you along with this process in case you choose to go this route, we give you all the information we possibly can so that way you can make adjustments to your palate and make it perfect exactly. for you. Like if you know, you've watched four or five of our videos and you know, okay, every time you guys make it this level of sweetness, it's always too sweet for me. Okay, back off five or 10 points from what we do, and that might be your sweet spot. We're fairly consistent in what we like, so if you know that we're five or 10 points high, you can be five or 10 points below us, and you're probably gonna like it if you like it that way. The Conversely, is also true. if you like it sweeter than we do, always add a few more points. I mean, that's the beauty of homebrew, is you're making it for you. You're not making it to appease some unknown they. It's not like the honey police are gonna knock on your door and say, you put too much honey in that mead. I mean, come on, nobody does that. So there's no such thing as too much unless you find it disgusting, then you put in too much. Now, if you give it to someone and they don't like it, that's because it's not their taste. That doesn't make you wrong. That just means you have different tastes. Sorry, once it's sweet, you can't take it back. But if you know you have someone who likes things dry and you like things sweet, you can always keep it dry and sweeten to taste in the glass or on a per bottle basis if you wanted to. And that way you can have it your way and they can have it their way. And it's kind of like Burger King. So do you know what Brian just told you? What? He said, go share a drink with your friends. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. And if they don't like it, then stop sharing. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> not what he said. <laughs> anyway, so what we're going to do with this now is we're going to rack it back into a closed mouth. We're going to put an airlock on it, and we are going to pasteurize this. Pasteurization process is very simple. 140 degrees internal temperature for 15 minutes. We have a video on that. Link in the description, probably. So, yeah. Do that, and we're going to be back in like, a, I don't know, a few days to a week to give the final, actual, ultimate tasting on this brew. Okay, so it's been like another week, um, five days actually, and after pasteurization, we let this settle for a while. It looks like it did some, it's hard to say, it's really, really dark. Super dark. So we're going to rack it to a pitcher and we're going to give you our final assessment of the early taste, because the real taste is like a year. So, you know, that's in a year, but we're, we'll do this now. Because I can't see the bottom, <laughs> I'm gonna leave the cap on because I don't know what's in there, you know? I don't want any surprises. Although, if it wasn't clear, would we even notice? It does have a really awesome red color coming through the tubing. Mm -hmm. So we end with about 116 ounces. Time for taste. As I said, it has this <laughs> amazingly gorgeous red color. It's, it's beautiful. It's very clear, actually. Yeah, it's just... 
It's just so dark. It's crazy dark. <laughs> it's really pretty though. So clarity is like nine to ten. I mean, it's 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 easily perfect. The color is amazing. The There's, smell is a little odd. It's just like berry and coffee to me. With a little like citrus in there. Sort of. Is that citrus? It's almost like coffee and chocolate combined. Yeah. Sort of. It is unusual. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just unusual. So there is this candy that's acai berry um, enveloped in dark chocolate. And this smells like that candy. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> well, that can't be all bad then. I'm going in. That's really good. It, it is really good. That is <clears throat> incredibly good. It kind of <laughs> reminds me of a... Like a port wine. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I'm like, mm -hmm. is that the right word? Uh, something... It's so rich. Really rich. And viscous. Really thick that you would enjoy at, after a meal. Yeah. Um, I need to figure out the alcohol content. I probably did earlier, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It started at 1.096. It ended at 1.000. So we got 96 points times 135. This is 13%. It, it makes me think it's higher than 13%. It does. <laughs> it's got such a very aggressive forward uh, flavor. It makes you think it's higher alcohol than it is. And I think that's the, the coffee chocolate notes that are coming through that make you feel like... There's something more going on here. But this is complex. I mean, there's so much yeah. going on. I'm getting that wheat note again on the exhale. It kind of reminds me, not exactly the same, obviously, but it reminds me sort of our piment port. Yeah, very much so. It tastes like a fruity port, like a, a berry port, which, yeah, that's kind of what it is. I mean, it's just not, it just hasn't been fortified. I'm glad we sweetened it to the level that we did. Yeah. Because I feel without that sweetening, the The honey was lost. The honey was lost, that is true. Um, but the the tartness that I'm getting from the the, the chocolate coffee yeah. combo, I think would be way too prominent without the additional mm -hmm. sweetness. And 1.030 is sweet, okay? By some standards that's very sweet, by some standards it's just sweet. Depends on how you want to go. But I don't really look at the numbers so much as how it tastes. To me, this doesn't taste 1.030 sweet. It tastes more like 1.010 sweet because the tartness of those berries and the earthiness yeah. really takes that sweetness level back. And that's what balance is all about. You have to balance all those flavors with the sweetness to get it to, so that it all melds together and comes together nicely. And I would say we balanced it perfectly. This yeah. has a great um, acidic bite. It has an amazing mouthfeel. It's viscous, but it also isn't like thick, cloying thick. But then it has a, a nice level of sweetness to it that takes all those things and kind of smooths the edges out. It just this is wonderful. The earthy berry combination kind of reminds me of elderberry. Yeah, yeah, it has a lot of it. I like this better than elderberry. I do too. It's not as earthy or funky tasting it's got a little bit of funk to it don't get me wrong and it's not young wine funk it's just acai berries have a little bit of a weird funk to them that's just the way it is um the process of creating this brew actually remind me a lot of the process of creating a banana beverage because there were stages of it where you're oh, just kind of like say. What have we gotten ourselves I into? I don't know. This is what this is supposed to be like. I I have some concern. Yeah, this is the one that kind of looked like swamp water for the a while. Right? The oil slick that was on top. Oh yeah. By the way, completely gone now. Yeah. So yeah, there's nothing. The different rackings and and our technique of being very careful not to get that uh, paid off because there there's no sign of it at all anymore. Yeah. Mm. This is this was a thing going into it from the very beginning. I. I had serious doubts. I mean, we used frozen puree, okay? <laughs> it <laughs> it's was, meant for smoothies. It was a mess. It was just a mess. But now that is done, I'm glad we did it, and I'm pleasantly surprised. Yeah. 
I'm trying to think of what's wrong with it. I mean, if I take you on the journey, as it hits your mouth, it's berry sweetness. It's like berries covered in honey. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Then you get the 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 mouth feel and the earthiness starts to come through a little bit, but the sweetness carries that just enough that it's not off putting. And then on the exhale or on the on the exhale, I'm jumping ahead. On the the finish, it's actually a nice, rich, smooth, longer finish. It's beautiful. On the exhale, I do get that little bit of like the wheat, yeah, kind of thing, which I'm not sure exactly what that is. I don't know if maybe that's an effect of pasteurization, or if it's that particular honey. Have or... you ever heard of anybody talking about it? No, wheat? but that doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> Could happen. Um, somebody will tell us. Somebody has had it before, and they'll they'll, they'll tell me. Um, somebody recognized it the last time I recognized it too. So they they said I've experienced that before. <laughs> I'm kind of floored. I didn't expect this to be this good. Yeah, I was I was actually anticipating not being happy with it. <laughs> yeah, that's a terrible thing to say, but it's the truth. But it's got multiple levels to it. You know, like there's the sweetness of the berry, <clears throat> but then there's the earthiness of the berry, and there's that coffee cacao chocolatey thing that that's going on on the side there then you have the that rich mouth feel going on almost a smokiness even just because it's so rich and dark yeah it's it's interesting because it has aspects of port wine it yep. has aspects even of some bourbons and whiskeys and some just sweet red wines it's yeah it's kind of a little bit of all of those things put together and it's good aspects of all those things it it, it's very, that's why I'm having trouble putting it into words because it's very complex. There's a lot of layers to it. And I'd probably have to drink half of this to really break it down. <laughs> and uh, we have other <laughs> videos to make. Like, too. Yeah, it's good. Just make it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and by the time we do that, you know, we won't be do, making any of the videos today. So that's not going to happen. But it's just really, really good. Are you, uh, I'm thinking of a number. Sure. I'm just trying, I'm, I'm glancing over there trying to see what we put in this. And it was basically. This is acai berry smoothie, wine tannin, pectic enzyme, Red Star Premier Classique, wildflower honey, and Fermate O with some water. That's it. Yeah. Nothing super fancy. And then we expect sweetened with more honey. Yep. Yeah. This, this flavor profile, as we are trying to convey with you, to you, which I, I think we, we've accomplished that, is far more complex than what our ingredients suggest. And you know, that's part of homebrew. You might not like that we used pectic enzyme or wine tannin. You know what, you can skip those. You can use a, a cup of tea and leave the pectic enzyme out and it's fine. The fermato, I think is kind of important just because it's like an insurance policy. I would say because this is so dark, if you're using the pectic enzyme you as a clearing notice. agent, don't bother with clearing agents yeah. in this particular brew because it's super dark. It's going to be so dark. It may have pulled a little bit more sugars out, but we don't really know. They were blitzed to oblivion. They were smoothie processed. Yeah. So I so don't think... Probably not. <laughs> so were they necessary? No, I don't think so. The tannins, I think, help this. Just a little bit of a tannic aspect is a good idea yeah. in this one. I think the tannins helped elevate that dark chocolate coffee yeah. situation yeah. that well, we Well, they gave it... On more balance they added to the depth of it and i think had they not been there it Anymore. would be it would be overly sweet at this point um so they kind of balance the sweetness back a bit and they um keep it in check but at the same token they add their own flavor component and experience component so without them i think i'd miss it all right i need more too see when we go back for thirds you know that either means we're thinking really hard about a specific number and trying to see if it really is worth that, or we just really like it and just feel like- Well, this, as I've said before, has shades of our Pimet Port, which I really enjoy. And I'm glad that the ABV of this isn't as high as our Pimet Port was. The Pimet Port is a grape mead that then got fortified, and that's what created the the portness of it uh, is oh, it a right. port no it's not a port we were just trying to replicate that kind of scenario that was our homegrown grapes yes okay um i believe yeah I i'll think. put a link in the description since maybe. i mentioned it so many times it's a you definite can, possible you can maybe check it out but that's what that uh was. it was delicious it was wonderful i think it's all gone because i think i drank it all oh yeah it's gone. Um, long gone. but it had a punch that fortification certainly showed itself now someone will ask could you have fortified this Sure, um, but... Yeah, I don't think you'd gain much, though. No, it has that 
Just more alcohol. That's that, all you really get. And I think you might lose some flavors. Right, because it already has the sensation that it's a higher ABV. Yeah, it really than does. It now, is. if you wanted to use like a, a, a neutral alcohol, like vodka or something, that actually almost could make sense. You could have done that instead of pasteurizing as, mm. a, as an alternative. Mm -hmm. It would have upped the ABV. You would get a little bit more ethanol bite, um, but I think it would still work out. So that's one way that you can... We get a lot of people that want to avoid pasteurization, and I'm not really sure why. Um, we have had, in all the times that we've pasteurized, one bottle break, and it was a closed bottle. It was the fault of the bottle, not it was the, the fault bottle, of the bottle, not process. the pasteurization. Yeah. They were bouncing around, and it was my fault. It was one of the thinner bottles, and it just it broke. But since we've been doing it in the fermenter, zero issues whatsoever. It works beautifully every single time. Super simple. Let it settle afterwards. Nothing in the bottles. It's it's great. And if you're worried about losing flavors and, and all that, watch our videos because. They're probably, our, our responses are higher and better after it's been pasteurized yeah. than before. Yeah. And there's something to be said because heat treating wines and things like that is a pseudo, it's used as a pseudo aging process. Okay. Some people do that, like commercials do that on purpose to mellow out, to smooth things. So it is a kind of a proven method. People have been using it. I have a question, and yeah. this this came to mind when you're talking about this. Have we done a test yet about pasteurization versus pasteurization? Yeah, versus we totally did. We did. Yep, and, and we, we liked, liked the, the pasteurized one better. Okay, that's what I thought. Yep. Yeah, we actually liked the pasteur. We did that test, and we can put the link in the description. We did a test where we pasteurized a brew, and we didn't pasteurize that brew, and we tasted them together. We liked the pasteurized one better. Was there a huge difference? No. No. No, you, right. you would have to have tasted them side by side or you wouldn't know. So back to my original track that we got sideline on. All right, well, now Shocker. we need more. Um, besides the Piment Port, it is also reminding me. For those keeping me, track, this is four times. It, it is also reminding me of a brew that we did that is near and dear to my heart. And that's Klingon, Klingon Bloodline. Blood wine because yep. the of aspect. the complexity and that coffee note. The only thing that's missing from this. that it's I chilly. Is the spice, the chili, yeah. <laughs> Put some chili in this um, and you got... Our, turn uh, this into a capsicamel and you have a cheater cleaning on blood wine, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, kind of. I think it needs a little more of the coffee note to really be there. Yeah, but if, if you just felt like taking the easy route out and you had access to an acai, then I would say do this and add a chili and... Yeah, it's interesting it. that acai does a better... I think the acai does a better job of the cleaning on blood wine than what we used. It has a little more... It's very robust. It's very strongly flavored, um, and that okay. that's hard to do. Um, we didn't use a tremendous amount of fruit, but it has the feeling that we packed like a hundred oh, yeah. pounds of fruit oh, into yeah. this. It really does have that strength of flavor. It does. And that's why I think it would make a great Klingon bloodworm. I I agree. I, I feel that that almost aggressive. Oh, flavor. so okay. Here's what we do. We take this kind of a mead, right? Doesn't even have to be mead, but that's the mead it works. Take this, add some coffee, add some chili, and fortify it. Klingon blood wine. There you go. You know what? Revisit Klingon blood wine. Somebody asked us a couple weeks ago if we would revisit Klingon blood I wine. I was like, why? I was like, why? It was it's good. Fantastic. <laughs> so, well, you know what? Mm. Maybe we will. Maybe right. we All will. All right, I need I need to stop daydreaming. It's also got the right color. It's 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 beautiful. It's like eighty percent there. Yep, needs coffee and chili and right. fortification and fortification with like rum. Yeah, well then we we should leave out the honey then. I don't know. I don't know. We'll think about it. And come up with a recipe and probably work on that soon. I really want to go to like 0. 0.75. That's, that's, that's why I'm delaying on this because I can't. I'm like a roulette. I'm between a half and a, and a whole number. My my brain is a roulette I, table. I, the ball's just spinning and spinning and spinning. I think I know what I'm going to do, though. Spinning and spinning. I think it's the only fair way to go. Because I think about this in reference to other things that we've made and where's it fall. Our, our numbering system is pretty vague. It's kind of like um, the Drew Carey show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? We make them up as we go along and they don't really matter. But... We go one through ten. If it's below a one, it's a zero or 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 a point five, and that probably got dumped out before the video got finished. So <laughs> no. that's really bad. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, yeah. 
Point right. five, yeah. Yeah, that's just horrible. Like something went drastically <laughs> wrong. Like, what do we do? A one <laughs> is drinkable, but you really don't want to. A 10 is really, really good. It's like the best. An 11 is just a step above the best. That doesn't even make sense anymore. It doesn't make any Somebody sense. Somebody the other day said that I gave an 11.5 to something. Did I give an 11.5? I, I would have to look at the chart. I don't think I gave an 11.5. Um, I think I gave a 10.5. So after this video, I need to update the chart. So yeah. the chart that I'm referring to is the spreadsheet of doom. I think it's also called the city studying scorecard. It's posted on our website. I'll put it in the link in the description. And it basically has all of the brews that I could find the, the data. And some of them, because they're way at the beginning, don't have the complete data list. But all the data I can find, I put in this chart. And it's brew name, brew date, bottling date, ABV, final gravity. All the pertinent information. What Brian and Derga scores were initially, what Brian and Derga scores were one year, what Brian and Derga wow. scores were two years. So She spent like three days working on this. It drove me literally batty. So She grew wings and everything. I did. I flew around. <laughs> Brian like tried to get a little net to catch me. It was it was crazy. I got the fly swatter up. Um but I'm trying to keep that updated. It's 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 a challenge, I'll, I'll be honest with you. But I wanted to have that available to everybody so you could see it's too long. what our thoughts were and what was going on. And, and it's interesting seeing it all in a spreadsheet where you can see, oh, they really liked it initially and then they didn't like it so much or they didn't like it at all initially and then, wow, they really loved it after that one year. And so that will help you understand if you're replicating our recipes, if like, okay, this is going to be great if I drink it right away, or this one, you're just going to put away and forget that's about fair. it, and then it'll be good to go. So that's that's why I'm doing it. That's my modus operandi. operandi. All right, so I get a number. I'm working on mine still. Okay, I'm number two. Are you ready? One, two, three, Nine ten. Nine point five. I was between 9.5 and 10, I just on the edge. And you know what made me go to 10? I gave a 9.5 to something recently, and I think this is a little bit better. Hmm. And I, my judge for a 10 is, would I actually seek that beverage out saying, I would like to drink that without seeing the shelf behind me? Just ah. will it pop into my head and go, that's what I want to drink. Pre-visualization. That's right. So, you know, every once in a while I do that. I think this is up there. All right. I don't think it's quite as good as my methaglin. I don't think it's quite as good as some of the other things we've made that have gotten higher scores. Sure. But, but it's, it's like it's this, a 10. It's, it's its own thing. It's it's way better than we expected. Uh, absolutely. It's off the charts great for flavor, for everything about it is awesome. I'm even seeing ways that we can use this concept and make something else from it. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. We're drinking this at room temperature. I think if this was chilled a little bit, this would be amazing. Put a little cinnamon on the top, on the rim of your glass, and this is almost like a sangria. It's that kind of rich. It has all those flavor components that make it really amazing. It's a 10 to me. I'm not going to argue that you gave it a 9.5. That's totally It's only right. half a point lower yeah, than Yeah, it's not really that different. <laughs> so basically, this is awesome. Go make this, is, is the gist of it. But we have now drank um, a little over 10 ounces of it. So before we drink any more, we're going to bottle it. But in the meantime, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.